Um, okay, so so I guess my question was is like if that's because you were like you framed it in a way about the spiritual experiences like you can't imagine like if someone's had the experience that you've had the spiritual experience that like someone would ever stop doing the work like that was kind of how you phrased it yeah i can't imagine i can't imagine that that's possible and i'm uh, again i need to stress like i'm willing to be wrong about that i i can consider mm -hmm. i'm not like married to that theory Mm -hmm. I'm aware that my experience was I went to treatment for the first and only time when I was 20 and I got sober and I've never looked back. And, mm -hmm. um, I've even, I've even made a ton of mistakes in sobriety, like big ones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the thing is people will question that. You know, if you're guilty of something like 13th stepping, a newcomer, or stealing in recovery, or, you know, um, you know, jumping from job to job, never being stable financially, there was a period yeah. of time in my recovery where I, I moved, like, I, I'd live at a place for barely 30 days, getting mail there and everything, like making all, like the switch to everything, and then 30 days later, I'm out. Um, mm -hmm. night moves, fly by night moves, stuff that people would point to and say, spiritual make This is like, you're not spiritual. Yeah, alcoholism. Yeah. We'll, we'll do that for behavior all the time. But then someone relapses after a year of sobriety and it's like taboo to even suggest you weren't spiritually fit as evidenced by the relapse. But we'll point to all this other behavior that I stayed sober through. And, and, and so to me, it's just like if we are willing to point to shady behavior, and even suggest that maybe that person's not spiritually fit, then why do mm -hmm. we hesitate when a person's period of sobriety comes to an end with a relapse? Like, why do we hesitate to say, because to me, that's like the best evidence of not being spiritually fit. If you're yeah. going to line up every possible thing a person could do mm -hmm. in sobriety that demonstrates they're not spiritually fit, honestly, I've got murder here and relapse here. Right. Like I, it's like, to me, it's just the no brainer that relapse means not spiritually. If any other behavior could possibly mean not spiritually fit. Yeah. Then how does relapse not be at the top of that list or at least be on the list? Well, because especially since the program, the whole point of the pro, I mean, the whole point of the program is to have a connection with a higher power, but like, but to also relieve our alcoholism. So like if our alcoholism isn't relieved, then we haven't, like we don't have the spiritual experience to like yeah. give us the power to do that, to overcome it. Right. Yeah. Like our, our book is really clear. I think, I think we do a terrible job of confusing our, um, our disease with our defects of character. Like we don't have a monopoly on lying, cheating, stealing, um, acting mm -hmm. out sexually. Um, that's what I, that's what I've been like trying all of this, the twofold versus threefold thing. And like, and the spiritual experience. Cause like w if your reasoning is correct, then I was like, and I said this last session too, but like, why do we have to keep doing the work? If, if first of all, we, I guess we wouldn't actually truly know if we've had the spiritual experience that you're talking about. Real, like there's always going to be a little, like, I think I have, but like, do I know if I have, I, you know, like, I don't know if I have, but like, why would we continue to do the work if it's like, we're, we're not cured, but kind of cured kind of thing is like how I'm thinking about it. Yeah. And the analogy that I go back to for that is, um, you know, if you're, uh, if you're serving a life sentence, for um for you know just a life sentence and but you're eligible for parole there are steps that you have to take to get parole and um once once you take those steps and they parole you um you are free i mean you can get philosophical and say well because because they can revoke your parole at any time you're really not truly free but okay, if you woke up in jail this morning and you went to bed in your bed in your home this evening, you're free. 
mm-hmm. this, right? You've been mm-hmm. pretty, uh, philosophical mm-hmm. distinctions aside. Um, you're not going to bed behind bars tonight. That's freedom. Right. Like today you're free. Right. And so, um, you know, spiritually awakened might give the impression that there's this one time permanent thing. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but the person who's been paroled has to do things to maintain parole. Right. They have to do things to Mm -hmm. maintain parole. And those mm-hmm. things are slightly different or maybe more advanced than what they had to do to get paroled. Um, here's the distinction I make. Why is there recidivism? Why do people who get paroled go back to jail? Yeah. I would offer that they were never free. That the distinction of behind bars and not behind bars actually isn't the distinction of freedom for them. Freedom from them is being able to do whatever the hell they want. And they can do that behind bars, and they in fact do that. But these are the guys who run the prisons, right? When they're behind bars, they do they do they get high, they they have cell phones snuck in, right? They they're they're living life behind bars probably better than they are outside. And so the distinction of well, you've been paroled isn't really freedom for them. It's actually more restrictive because I can go shank someone in the shower, and that's that's par for the course, and that's right at home for me. Whereas now I'm having to do this stupid nine to five job and I got to call someone every night. They're not really experiencing freedom. I would submit to you that the person who is actually experiencing freedom would never stop doing the things that maintain that freedom. So someone, someone gets, you know, spiritually paroled. They think they're Uh spiritually free, but it's not really freedom for them. They're Uh not really experiencing um, if I can, you know, as humbly, I say this as humbly as I can, they're not really experiencing like what I'm experiencing. Yeah. I would never want to stop doing this stuff that yeah, like maintains me where I'm at. You, um, I'm sorry. I'm, I, I know I overthink this stuff so much. I'm so sorry, but can you like give me a little description of what you think of as like your experience of freedom from, because of the steps in the program and that's a tough thing to put into words let me, let me think about it. i know it is it's like it's like conceptualizing higher power too but like maybe i'm overthinking it well i just um i don't uh and it's and it's you add to the fact that um you really can experience more depth as you go right you can i mean um right. step, it, it, step 11 is is improve our conscious contact with god and if you mm-hmm. tell me there's not going to be further spiritual experiences down the road as a result of that right um and i guess i guess to me it's just like i've never stopped seeking um i've never well here's the through line in my recovery if Mm -hmm. i'm pointing to why i'm still sober because i'll be honest with you the daily disciplines of prayer and meditation have never been a point for me like the daily disciplines of of um uh inventory like i have gone um i think I think in the 20 years I've been sober, the discipline of praying first thing in the morning and uh, nightly review at night, Mm -hmm. of doing that every day. I think my personal record is 30 days in a row, and that's because I put my mind to it to do it. Like I I said, okay, I have to do this every day. I got to do this at least 30 days in a row. Um, I might be two days on or two days off or two weeks on, two weeks on. Hell, I might be two months off. And then do it for a week, and then return to it. Um, that's been re- that's been routinely inconsistent, consistently inconsistent um, the whole time I've been sober. I don't go mm-hmm. a day without prayer. Yeah. But the discipline of like first thing in the morning and last thing at night that yeah that, that's all. But I don't. It's not like I go without prayer throughout the day. Um, mm-hmm. But the through line in my recovery has always been working with others. Um, I, I, um, I don't say no 
to, Mm -hmm. um, to someone that asked me to work with them. Um, and I I will, (laughs) yeah, like I just, I'm always, I'm, I'm always like willing to do that. And what I'm willing to do for my sponsees is pretty, again, I'm not trying to brag. I'm just saying like, I've driven an hour and a half to go pick someone up that I knew was drunk. You know, I've spent hours Um, on the phone. I've, um, yeah. You know, I, I, I don't do the willingness test. You don't have to prove to me that you're willing. I'll, I'll, I'll sponsor someone into the grave, and I have. Um, I sponsored a guy for almost five years that couldn't put 90 days of sobriety together the entire time. Um, mm. If someone wants to keep working with me, I'm willing. I don't need anything from them. That's pretty much been something really consistent for me, too. I don't say I really know pretty much never say no in general to AA, but yeah, especially someone asking for help. I also don't fire people. Yeah, I don't either. Yeah. Um, primarily because I've never hired them, but uh, you know, that's a like gen- terminology. People. Yeah. I know. I know. It's weird. It, there's a weird connotation with like, I heard someone say like, oh, I'm going to be your future ex the other day to their sponsee. And I was like, that sounds weird. That sounds weird. Like, we're not dating, you know? I, I also hold the, yeah, that is super weird. But I also hold the um, the truth. Like, in here, the absolute truth is that they are helping me more than I'm helping them. Like, that's not a pithy, like, little saying. Like, in my mind, there is, yeah. like, that is the absolute truth. And so. Hi there, and welcome yeah. to List Hold Outbreak. On. Sorry. That was an email that I mistakenly opened. Um, no worries. So, uh, but that's a good that's a good frame of mind. Around, I mean, obviously that's important and true. Um, yeah, that they're helping. I, I, like I truly, I truly believe that. Like I truly, I, I think there are some people that take the twelve step. Like if we have this um, recovery triangle with uh, recovery at the bottom, unity, and then service. I truly think there are people that view recovery, the recovery leg is one through 12, and then the service leg, or one through 11, and then the service leg is 12. Mm -hmm. And those are separate legs for a reason. And step 12 has to be on my recovery leg. It can't be on my service leg. Um, I'm not 100% sure uh, what the big book authors meant when they say as soon as we put our work on the service plane, the alcoholic commences to rely on us instead of God. But I'm hard pressed to think of anything other than a warning against putting step 12 on the service plane. And it just, that's in plain English, what that seems to say to me. Um, like when we start to frame it in a way where we're like, well, I'm just being of service here. I'm not. Okay. I work okay. steps one through 12 to recover and then I work, or I work steps one through 11 to recover. And then I work step 12 to be a nice guy. Um, and I think yeah. there's truly some people that have that attitude about the step work. And, um, I mean, I know I have had that attitude. I know I have for sure. I mean, it's easy. We find prestige. I feel like in everything too, is the other thing. So, yeah. or we try to at least accolades yeah. and prestige and, yeah. I mean there there is um there is a level of humility to the realization that um I am not really doing anything to secure my own recovery. Like it's I've had a personality change as the result of working these steps. My continued connection with God is necessary to maintain that. The absolute yeah. realization that that's that I need to maintain that connection is part of that personality change. And you know what I realized after our first conversation, though? Um, what? I meditated on that for a while. And um, yeah. this is really an age-old question. And so it's okay if, if someone wants to disagree with me on it. Because I don't know if you're familiar with Christianity. Uh, but in Christianity, oh. in Christianity, there's this ongoing debate, in-house debate, between mm-hmm. Christians. This isn't like people calling, saying that the other people aren't Christians. But right. between people who recognize each other as Christians, um, yeah. can you lose your salvation? 
right? You have the once saved, always saved camp, and then you have the, you know, it's backslider. You can be a backslider and lose your salvation. And I thought right. to myself, this is a very similar, this is a very similar debate, you know? Yeah. Can you have a spiritual awakening in a way that you can lose it down the road? Or once you have a spiritual awakening, is, is it characteristic of that spiritual awakening that you will continue to do the things that you need to do to, to maintain? Yeah. It? Yeah. That's the camp I happen to be in. I don't think that someone who disagrees with me is an idiot. Um, I'm not married to being right about that. Yeah. I recognize there's two sides to that debate, but I do believe it's strong. Like, I do believe, like, it, it just really is hard for me to, to see the other point of view. It's hard for me to say, how did you, yeah. how did you have it? And it led you to using Kratom and then relapse. Like, how, how is that a spiritual awakening? Um, you know, yeah, definitely. So, um, anyway, so you don't have to agree with me on that. I, you know, I don't well, want to use the issue for you or anything. I don't know if it matters if I, if I know or not. And I think it's, I think some of it for me was like fear and being scared that like, well, also just like, just changing the way I know the program. <laughs> <laughs> too and having a new experience is like I guess been hard for me um to like think outside of what I think I know which is I'm already hearing that's um some ego there or something but um I mean my biggest thing was like I just was like okay if that's the truth about a spiritual experience and honestly I'm kind of I kind of i I just like I don't it's hard to say out loud but I feel like I'm in the same camp as you is like when I got here, like I had that experience that has given me some, like, I relate to what your experience with your spiritual experience a lot. Um, but then I just was like, why, like if I'm, if the drink problem, if I've had that experience, then like, why do I keep doing this? Like, do you, like, do you, my, one of my questions was like, do you do the steps over and over again? And if you do, why? Not, not as a rule. Um, I did about two years ago get a new sponsor, um, the one who used that, that fridge uh, oven analogy. And um, I worked through the steps with him. And to be clear, um, I don't think it's actually possible to, if you've had a spiritual awakening, um, mm -hmm. you're actually no longer powerless over alcohol. That's my view, right? Yeah, um, you've been right. restored to sanity. So it's, right. it's actually impossible to go back and work the first step again. Right. Um, so that, that at least the first step, if not the first three steps, that process there is just about presentation. How do I present right. this to someone else? I think this guy's got a good way of presenting it, and I want to learn how to present it better. So he takes me through the first three steps, which is basically he takes me through his, his adequate presentation. Mm -hmm. I did write inventory. I didn't just watch how he instructed me to do it. I wrote along as he was instructing me, and I did do a fifth step with him where I shared those things. Okay. And I, did, I did have a new experience with those things. And there were some things that had not been addressed on the regular 10 steps or nightlies that so it, needed to get It's like out. kind of a lifelong unearthing still. In that it can be ideally, um, and I don't, I don't claim perfection with this, but ideally, uh, ten and eleven take care of anything that a fourth step would need to take care of. The reason we go in for an annual house cleaning, like they talk about, yeah. in twelve, is because we yeah. are not saints and we don't practice these things perfectly. Right, like which is what you said. Like you haven't done, like you've been consistently inconsistent or whatever. Right, and right. That makes. Sense. And that's survivable. I mean, that really is survival. Well, that's been my experience too. Like I meditation is like, I don't, I've only recently kind of started to get more into it regularly. I've done the, I prayer, I, I prayed every morning and every night since I got sober, but um, the nightly inventory has only been like this year and it's sporadic too. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's, um, it's one of those things where it's like, I think people put the work on a pedestal. Yeah. Um, I mean, I know, I, I know 
I'm like really guilty of like people. Ugh, I'm really guilty. I talk a lot in meetings here and it's small. It's a pretty small community. So we know each other. So like, I'm pretty well known in the rooms kind of here. It's kind of sorta. And I definitely, it's like an ego thing for sure. Cause. Oh yeah. I mean, I get a lot of feedback about my shares and stuff and people have even held me to high standards. Cause they're like, you were just recently. They're like, I don't understand why you're behaving this way. Cause you work such a good program, you know? So. Yeah. And, and that's, it's like, I don't, I think that that kind of lends itself to, um, that kind of lends itself to like the misconception of what people think this is. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not working these steps as a means of staying sober. Um, like that's, that's self will, right? It's like, I'm working a good program. And if I just do, if I just do this hard enough and I do this well enough, I'll stay sober and we can compare programs to one another. And this guy's got a better program. There's one program you work yeah. in spiritually fit. Yeah. Like, I know. Yeah, that's true. When, when he says we're not cured of alcoholism, mm -hmm. he's trying to clear this up. that This isn't a one undone. Yeah. What we really have is a daily reprieve, which is what mm -hmm. people on parole have. That's where I came up with that analogy. It's the way mm -hmm. look, let's see. That's what reprieve means. Um, contingent yeah. on, watch this, not our spiritual condition, yep. but the maintenance. Yep. Right? And so it doesn't matter if I have a better spiritual condition than you. Um, I can have a better car than you, but if I don't maintenance it, it's not going to get me from point A to point B. Right. And so it's, it's based on the maintenance, like how well am I maintenance in this? Now I, I would offer that it's possible to write nightly review every night. Yeah. Go through the motions of rote prayer every morning and, um, you know, 10 step all my problems all the time and, and just be out there and not really be maintenance in anything, not really be trying to establish a connection with God and making it about my efforts to go through the mechanics of the program. Effectively. Yeah. And so the difference would be like, not the disciplines of like, yeah, those are like, obviously the commonality, just like, those are the disciplines, but like the orienting ourselves to be of service and of, and, and like do carry out God's will. It's yeah. kind of the difference. Yeah. I make an agreement in step three with God and then am yeah. I attending to that agreement. Yeah. Um, I do need to be on top of resentment, selfishness, dishonesty, fear. There is no version of the program where I'm letting those things go unchecked. Um, but they've given us enough tools to deal with that. They've given us a fourth step, a 10 step and an 11 step to deal with those things. And between those three things, we ought to be able to stay on top of them pretty well. Yeah. And to get wrapped up in the mechanics of it without understanding the purpose of it um, is what I see a lot of people do. Right. Right. Like, it, I mean, I've heard like, it just makes me think of like when people talk about integrity and like, you know, what we do behind like closed doors. It's like you can be a certain way in a meeting, but like if you're not caring, like if you're not doing that in other areas of your life at work everywhere, right, then like there's something wrong. Well, and it's not about our behavior. It's about attending to our behavior. I got a, I, I got a kid I was working with. He's 24. And I'm like, dude, I'm going to tell you something that I wish somebody had told me when I got sober at 20. Um, your brain is literally not done forming yet. Yeah. Biologically speaking, that's been yeah. proven that that doesn't happen until 28. Yeah. So, um, you are, your neurons are going to be firing in weird directions. You might, you might think you're working a terrible program because you're going to be going off in all these crazy directions and, and, and you will just make a ton of mistakes. Yeah, um, definitely. So recovery for you is going to look like a willingness to apologize constantly. Mm -hmm. That's just what it's going to be. And right. you can't compare yourself to the 40-year-old guy who's got no relationships other than his wife and kids. He goes to work, yeah. comes home, uh, and, and goes to one meeting a week, and he's not interacting with people on the level that right. you are. 
And of yeah. course his behavior is going to be on point for the most part. Right. But I'll tell you what, he'll get three resentments while he's at work and ignore all of them. He'll have an angry outburst with his wife and just try to sweep it under the rug. Meanwhile, you had to apologize 10 times and you actually did it. Right. If you have to apologize 10 times and you actually do it all 10 times, yeah. you're more spiritually fit in my mind than the person yeah. who only has to do it once but ignores it. That's been, okay, that's what I was talking to Olivia about in the car the other night was like about the the spiritual like when I had the vital spiritual experience, something shifted in me even before I did any of the work. Mm-hmm. Obviously, like I had to do the work to like really like get to the causes and conditions of like my relationships yeah. with other people and stuff. But um, I had something happen where because I was like the most defensive person at work. Always. I could not take any criticism. I couldn't hold a job. I couldn't do any of that stuff. And something happened immediately before even working the steps where all of a sudden, like if I reacted to someone like I've made direct amends since I first got sober, like I have to say, sorry, like it eats at me if I don't say sorry immediately. Right. Like those like kind of changes happened like immediately, like the willingness. I mean, I haven't always been totally willing, but like I've, the willingness shifted immediately. The honesty piece shifted immediately for me. Like those were ones that were like I've had since pretty much the beginning. Well, I think there's people in this program that whose real hope for the 12 steps, and they might not even realize this consciously, but subconsciously that they truly are hoping the 12 steps will accomplish in their life Mm -hmm. is that it will put them in a position to be beyond reproach. Um, What is reproach? What does reproach mean? Like nobody can criticize me because I haven't done anything wrong. I'm impeccable. I haven't yeah. done any mistakes. Um, I, essentially, I want to be in a place where the 12 steps bring me to a place where I no longer need the 12 steps. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what people are secretly hoping for. And, yeah. Um, God will never bring you to a place where you don't need God. It just won't. Yeah. And again, we we talked about like perfection, perfectionism and perfection last time. but like we're also just chronic perfectionism. Like I have, I want to be perfect. And when I'm not, then I make a judgment that I'm, there's something wrong with me. I don't necessarily you know, want to be perfect. I want to have the, uh, bragging rights that perfection brings. Yeah. I, and if I can attain that without actually being perfect, that would actually be ideal. Yeah. I actually um, know exactly what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. Totally. I get it. Here's the que- here's the step six and seven question I'll ask people sometimes to really determine where your heart is at with willingness, okay? You got a genie that's going to grant you a wish, and you, you get to choose between one of two wishes. You only get to choose one. Um, either um, people will believe every word that you say for the rest of your life, whether it's true or not. People will will always regard you as a trustworthy, honest person. Or your ability to lie will be removed completely. You'll be unable to tell a lie, knowingly tell a lie. Yeah. The rest of your life. But people won't always believe you. People won't know that, that you can't lie. Yeah. And it's like, I think most of us are taking wish number one. I just want to be believable. I don't want to be trustworthy. I just want I, to be believable. I, well, I don't know. I'm, I don't. Okay. And I love that, by the way, when we we're talking about humility, that you pointed out that like, we have a weird re- relationship with the word humility. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause it's like, it's like, we make it like not humble to talk about our humility basically. Yeah. yeah um, but it's like, it's not humble to talk about. It's, it's not like not humble to talk about honesty or the fact that I don't. I know. That. Like, it really is like the same thing. Yeah. Um, but that's like another, that's like the other thing is like the lying thing for me was like removed. I feel like that pretty much like, I don't lie. Like I really, if I lie about something, like I even lie, I pulled like a, like a political comic strip off of a glass plexiglass thing at my work. And cause we're like, it's like crazy political out there. I don't know. There was some stuff going on and I, um, I thought it was one of the customers. So I pulled it off. And then my boss came in and was like, who did that? And she was like, 
she's really scary. So she was like yelling at everyone and I didn't say it. And then I came back the next day and I was like, Ricky, I did that. I'm so sorry. I won't do it again. Like those, I will, it will eat at me until I am honest. Yeah, no, I, I get that. But, but the, the heart question, right, the examination is, is my interest in the, the, the honesty for the sake of honesty or is my interest in the honesty for the sake of being viewed as trustworthy? I feel like mine's in the sake of like, it's, I mean, it has to do a lot with my program. It's not about the other people. It's like, but you can really, do that. You can do that with any defective character, right? Like I'm not yeah. just zeroing in on dishonesty. Yeah, that's yeah. just an example. But it, it, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll say that. Um, like, what's our motive behind it? Like when we're examining relationships with guys, a lot of time, you know, you can date your dream girl, but nobody knows. Are you more interested in that, or would you? Would it be like, no, nah, I'll, I'll I'll settle for less as long as everybody can see me with her, you know? And it's like. It, it, that, that's kind of, and they talk about that in the 12 and 12, you know, are we interested in humility for humility's sake? Or are we interested in sort of the way that it lets other people see us? You know, are we interested in being totally get that? Yeah, totally get it. Especially with like social media. It just makes me think of social media. Hmm. Cause I'm kind of big on, so I'm like on social media quite a bit on Facebook and uh, everything's about how I'm being perceived yeah so kind of reinforces that yeah absolutely yeah so let's um let's talk a little bit about step two okay um unless you want to talk some more about step one um, no that's okay i think, I think that's <laughs> um so um so step two, and also I just realized I could, I could put this like this since we're recording and this might be lit a little better and that way you have mm -hmm. a copy. You can just screenshot that. There you go. You have a copy of that, mm -hmm. that um, when, when I send you this. But um, so my thing with step two is that um, this is about willingness. I think we practice open-mindedness in step two around the wrong concept. Um, we'll practice open-mindedness around the concept of God rather than the concept of willingness. And what I mean by that is when we're working with a newcomer, we're so scared of frightening that person away or pushing that person away that mm -hmm. we will literally – before we've even gotten to the question of God, we'll like soft sell and be like, it, uh, it can be anything you want. So, you know, this isn't a, you know, we'll go out of our way to like bash religion and meetings in the hopes that it like doesn't frighten the newcomer and lets them know, hey, there's someone here that hates Christianity as much as you do, you know? And it's like, mm -hmm. I don't think we're making newcomers comfortable doing that. Um, but it doesn't matter because that's not what step two is about. It's not about finding a higher power that you're comfortable with moving forward. In fact, a red flag for me is when I sit down with someone to do step two. And this usually happens when I'm at work in treatment. Mm -hmm. um, someone will sit down and we'll start to talk about step two and they'll say, well, I finally figured out my higher power that was really bothering me for a while. And I finally found something that I can be comfortable with. And we, we will go along with that and say, Oh, it's great. Awesome. You know? And it's like, to me, that's a red flag because we're not talking about figuring out your higher power at step two. We're talking about being willing to discover a truth. You don't already know. And I, you know, evidence that we're focused on the wrong thing is that people will point out, well, step two doesn't say anything about God. It doesn't talk about God. So we get to step three. Well, okay. But it talks about a higher power and that's capitalized. And when the book uses a word that's capitalized, it shouldn't be. It's just another word for God. Yeah. So we're not, um, you know, it's like we are talking about God and confusing the issue and saying that there's somehow a difference between God and a higher power. 
um, it's not true. And I don't know that it's more effective. I don't know that it's actually helping anyone. Um, hmm. What we're really talking about is willingness. And I think we need to practice open-mindedness around the word willingness because um, we see the word willing and we think that that means I'm going to I'm going to have to start doing something. Like, do you now believe or are you willing to believe? And when you read when we read that, we go, oh, willing to believe must mean that I've got to start believing. No, it means are you willing to believe? Are you willing to go through a process that might create and instill a sense of belief? What this question is really asking you. So the step two question is really asking, and by the way, you know the step two question is on page 47, right? Is that from the two? Um, no, let me look it up. Yeah, on 47, it says we needed to ask ourselves but one short question. Okay. Do I now believe or am I... Or am I willing to believe? That is the step two question. And um, it's one question. So I don't need to know if you do believe or if you're willing to believe. I just need to know if it's one or the other. And when I first got sober, I looked at that question and I thought, they're just tricking me. Do you now believe? Well, no, I don't. Are you willing to believe? I just answered that. And if we can't see those as two different ideas, Mm -hmm. right? Willing to believe is not the same as do I now believe. Yeah. A prerequisite for being willing to believe is that I don't currently believe. And so um, what I think that question is really asking is, hey, if whatever you believe about the universe right now were wrong, would you want to know? That's what willingness is. Would I want to know? Would I want to go on a journey? Yeah. In other words, I was an atheist when I got sober. I didn't need to stop being an atheist at step two, but I needed to examine, am I an atheist because of lack of experience or am I an atheist by identity? Am I an atheist by choice? Um, Meaning that, you know, if you live on a deserted island with no uh, animals and you live on nuts and berries and you're a vegan because there's no animals on the damn island, it's by circumstance. right. That's, that's vastly different from being a vegan because you've decided ahead of time that you're not going to eat animal products. Mm-hmm. And so this is really asking, hey, if you're struggling with the God concept, is it, is it because you don't have an experience to rely on? Or is it because you just made a decision ahead of time you don't want to consume anything spiritual? If you're an atheist by choice, if you're an atheist by identity, we actually can't help you because there's no willingness to believe. Mm-hmm. Right. That's what these atheist groups in recovery don't understand. You know, when you have the, the atheist AA groups, mm-hmm. uh, you've, you've literally, you literally have to rewrite the steps because the step is just asking, are you willing and to make a point blank declaration? I'm an atheist and I don't need to believe in God. Like you've answered that question. No, you've said, no, yeah. I'm not willing. To yeah. So how can you move forward with the rest of them? Right. Yeah. And so that's what this question is really asking is, are, are you willing to, if what you believe were wrong, would you want to know? Now that's not yeah, just, that. yeah. And it's not just for atheists and agnostics. Yeah. It's, that's what I was thinking too. I, that, I, that's very universal. Cause mm-hmm. like we never really know, like, right. Like it's our own conception. So everyone walks in with preconceived notions and the preconceived notions as evidenced by your drinking aren't working. And so if there's something about those preconceived notions that aren't working, would you want to know? Or do you want to just continue and persist in these beliefs that haven't been working? It's impossible for any of whatever our conception was to ever have been the full truth about anything because we couldn't see anything like, like truthfully, right? Like in our drinkings, right? So I, I think that it is, it is possible to... Um, yeah, that's, I, I think it is possible to, hmm, how do I word this? Yeah. 
Yeah, let's let's uh, let's circle back around. The short answer is yeah, I agree with that. Um, I do think I do think it is possible to. Um, yeah, I, have faith or whatever when you. I think it's I think it's possible to say something that is true. Yeah. Right. Without necessarily knowing um, the truth. Um, you know, I'm saying something that, that happens to be true. Um, uh, like someone saying they're powerless before they really understand what that means. They just intuitively mm -hmm. know the word applies, mm -hmm. uh, but do they really know the truth? I mean, they're mm -hmm. using the right terminology, but they don't really know. Um, yeah. so yeah, but, but the short answer is, yeah, it, we, we, we are blocked. I mean, I know what you're saying though. Like, intellectual i mean it's i always come back to like the intellectual versus like experientially knowing something like it's the same with calculus like you can you can kind of like skate through calculus for a little while just knowing some of like you know the key points but it isn't until you understand the concepts because right. you really understand the concepts and and experienced it that you actually know and then you don't even need to, then you, you don't even need like the same information anymore because you have like this different understanding of the information. But let's say for, for simplicity's sake that it's yeah. objectively possible to know which political party is better than the other. Let's just, let's just, you know, you might even believe that. Let's just say that that's true. Um, an eight-year-old being raised in that political party, in that family, um, mm -hmm. being told, um, you know, this party's better than that party. That eight-year-old can make that statement without, without really understanding the truth of that. And so they, mm -hmm. they, do, they know the truth in the sense that they can say it, but they don't know it in the sense that they can, ex can actually interact with it. Um, they know of the truth. Maybe that's what I was looking for. It's possible to know of the truth without knowing the truth. Um, and that is particularly important because there's mm. three there's three types of people in this world. Every human being falls into one of these three categories. Um, there's lots of shades of gray underneath, but these three umbrellas make up every human being can be put in one of these three, and that's atheist, agnostic, or believer. Mm -hmm. Now, believer has a lot of connotations, but very simply, it just means I believe there's a God. Um, Maybe I believe there are several gods. Maybe I believe there's, right? Maybe I have a different concept of God, but I do believe there's at least a God, right? I believe yeah. in that. Um, right. An atheist believes there is no God, right? Right. So zero gods. An agnostic believes that it's not possible to know. And, or that it's, you know, yeah, it's not possible to know. Um, and those might not be dictionary definitions, but those are the ideas that I want to express by those three words. And there's, okay. shades, there's shades of gray, right? You can be agnostic thinking it's not possible, but hoping that God is real. You can be agnostic thinking it's not possible and hoping God isn't real. You can be atheist and be happy that there's no God because it suits your purposes. You can be atheist and be totally depressed about the fact that there's no God. You can believe there's a God and think he's a son of a bitch, or you can believe in God and be grateful that God's real. So there's lots of shades of gray. But it boils down to how do you answer the question, yeah. is, is God real? You either answer yes, no, or I don't know. And those are the three groups of people on this planet. Yes, there's a God. No, there's a God. I don't know. And that's the designation. Yes, no, or I don't know. Interesting. All three. Well, does that make sense to you, logically it speaking? Total sense. And like, it brings up, of course, like more questions always, but... <laughs> Always more questions, but yeah, no. What questions I just, do you have? Just like, depend. I guess it's not, I mean, it's kind of, I feel like, I don't know. It's just the first thing that popped in my mind. Sometimes I need to like, maybe just not say everything that pops in my mind, but like, depending on where your sponsees like fall into line with that, like, do you change your approach to the way that you do the steps? Kind of. Kind of. So here's, here's the understanding that, that I have. All three of these groups of people are capable of closed-mindedness. Mm -hmm. All three of these groups of people are capable 
of being blocked from God. Um, and in fact, if they're in the rooms for the first time and haven't worked the steps yet and are like three days since their last drink, they are in fact blocked from God. Now, um, the atheists, the closed mind, they're not automatically closed minded, but the, if closed mindedness does occur, here's where, it, here's where it comes in. The atheist has their mind shut that there is a God, if they're closed minded. The mm -hmm. agnostic has their the agnostic has their mind shut that it's even possible to explore such an issue if they have a closed mind, and the believer, if they have a closed mind, has their mind shut that the twelve steps can bring them closer to God, or that these AA people can teach them anything about God, um, and that's closed mindedness. Now, I'm not saying everyone's close. Some people walk yeah. in very open minded, but if you're closed minded and you're in one of those three three groups, that's what it typically looks like. Yeah. Um, now, who has an easier time overcoming that close-mindedness? And I would offer you that it is the atheist. I knew. I feel like I knew you were going to go that direction because they they legitimately have no problem saying, "I've never tried God before." Mm hmm. Right? And mm -hmm. they're, not, they're not making a point-blank declaration that it's not possible to know God, right? They, they've actually, they said, that, well, there is no God. That's what I've held this whole time. Uh, but if there was, why wouldn't I believe? And I've never tried to seek a connection. So, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll try this. They have an easier time being open-minded. I, I love working with atheists. I love working with atheists. Um, I don't know if, I, if this has ever come up in conversation, but I happen to be a Christian today. I wasn't when I got sober. Um, mm -hmm. I despise sometimes working with Christians. It's really tough. I've heard, <laughs> yeah, Bob D talks a, a lot about like working with, he's like like men of the cloth or whatever he said are the hardest yeah. by far. He, said, he always says like more than people working in treatment centers is yeah. like his, yeah. Yeah, it's tough because they have all these preconceived notions. They and also like do tons of studying and stuff too, and like you know more, you know more than most of us do in a lifetime. Yeah, yeah. The, the twelve and twelve talks to us about that too. It'll talk about you know, or no, it's actually the big book, and it'll say like, um, you know, let them know that their religious uh, training is probably more impeccable than yours. You know, throw them that bone. Mm -hmm. We don't have a monopoly on God. Um, what we, what we have discovered is that there's a difference between belief and relationship and, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, when I got sober, I was an, I was an atheist. I was actually a practicing Satanist and, um, my belief about God was three words. God is dead. That you could sum up everything I believed about God in those three words. Years later, I met a priest struggling to get sober mm -hmm. and what that priest knew about God could fill a library. Literally, this guy had read volumes and volumes and studied like you were saying. His belief mm -hmm. about God was huge compared to my belief about God. Our struggles, mine and his, at step two were exactly the same. They were exactly the same. The struggle at step two for each of us was that what we believed about God wasn't enough. And it wasn't because I needed to learn more or he needed to learn more. It's because belief is not enough. I mean, you can't even argue with that because like you guys, I'm guessing this isn't treatment or something that you guys were doing this like simultaneously. Like, well, no, I, met, I met a priest uh, a few years later at, at oh. a spiritual retreat who was struggling to get sober. Yeah. Um, so it's like the proof is in the pudding. Like it's mm -hmm. obvious that like whatever you, like however less or however much you knew about God wasn't working to keep you sober. Right. Like, I mean, well, even if you've had years at this point, but it's not that it wasn't working. It's that it's not, it couldn't have worked. That's the point I'm making is that okay, it couldn't so have self knowledge isn't enough to keep us sober right. and God yeah. and God knowledge isn't enough to keep us connected. Right. I can't yeah. just know God. I've got to have a relationship with God. Yeah. So, um, you know, how I describe it to believers is, um, you know, if you come into my house and you see me reading by candlelight, 
cooking food on a charcoal grill and uh, keeping warm by kerosene. And you're like, what gives, Derek? You know, did you become Amish? Are you like anti electricity? Mm-hmm. You don't believe in electricity? And I said, no, man, I believe in electricity. In fact, I pay the bill every month. Okay, well, let's plug in some appliances and flip some switches and turn some dials and push some buttons and pull some chains. And let's now you can start to have a relationship with electricity if you do those things. You can start to rely on this electricity that you believe in. Um, you know, I mean, if I'm, if I'm literally sitting in a dark room, by mm-hmm. candlelight, reading volumes about how electricity works, right? I don't have a relationship with electricity. I might have all the understanding in the world, but yeah, I, you're I'm, really not accessing it at all. Yeah. yeah. And that's a tough pill. Like that's an easy pill for an atheist to swallow. Like, yeah, duh, I've never tried God. Absolutely. I've never tried right. God. God's yeah. the last thing on the list. Might as well give it a shot. Um, but it can be a little tougher to really get that across to a staunchly religious person, not just Christians. I have encountered Muslims who go through the same thing. Um, Buddhists, you know, people that, that fans like new age people are really guilty of this, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so it's like, it's not, I don't want to, I don't want to beat up on the Christians. Um, Right. But when the 12 and 12 calls step to the rallying point between believers, atheists, and agnostics alike, what I think it's really saying is that this is the bottleneck, right? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, that's exactly what I was picturing, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah every, every, perfect. everyone's got the same, the same like, dilemma at this point. All, we're now grouping together. This is mm-hmm. where everyone, the separation between belief in the higher power comes together to, to yeah. one point. Yeah. And the reason for that is because um, regardless of what a person says, all three of those groups of people are living as an atheist. They're, li- they're living as an atheist. They're making fear-driven decisions. They're, they're proceeding through the universe as if there is no God. You know, the, the agnostic might say, well, I'm willing, uh, you know, I think there could be, there couldn't be, I don't know. Well, guess what? You can't really live as an agnostic. Um, agnosticism only exists up here. It's a philosophical construct. It's not a way of life. And what I mean by that is if you and I are in a room and there's no windows and I just say to you, um, it's raining outside. And you say, ah, well, you know, it could be raining. Maybe it's not raining. Uh, I'll remain agnostic on the issue. Well, that's all fine and well while we're in the room just having conversation. But if you actually try to put that in a practical application, when you leave the room, you either will or won't take an umbrella. And that's the moment when you decide how agnostic you actually are. Right? Like you, you can't just walk out of there living as if either option is possible. You either will act as if, yeah. it's, as if it's raining or you won't. Um, now people say, Derek, I'm just hedging my bets. I don't have to actually believe it's raining. I still want to live as if it maybe is possible. And I say, okay, how many agnostics are really doing that with God? That's possible there's a God, but I'm not living as if it's actually possible. I'm not putting hope in miracles. I'm not putting hope in the unseen. I'm acting as if everything here is absolutely solid all the way through. And I've got to protect myself and I've got to take care of myself. Um, and so it's like, and believers are just as guilty of that, making fear-driven decisions. And so atheist agnostics believers, they're all living as atheists. The atheists are the only one that actually have a reason for why they're living so fear-driven. They're living fear-driven because they openly admit there's no doubt. They're not paying lip service to believing anything else. And they're actually the most consistent of the three groups of people. Um, but that's, yeah, I, yeah, it's interesting. It's yeah. It's giving me a lot of food for thought for sure. Okay. Um, so what I like to do with people is I like to, um, I like to take them to page 55 in the book. If you have your book handy. I do. It's right in front of me. Excellent. 
and on this page there's um the first indented paragraph talks about yet we've been seeing another kind of flight uh comparing this to the wright brothers now they didn't bring up the Wright brothers for any old reason. They brought up the Wright brothers to illustrate how open-minded we are today about scientific progress. Uh, the world used to be really close-minded about scientific progress. It was against the law to autopsy a dead body for a long time. Um, we didn't need that knowledge. We didn't need to know about stuff like that. Today, uh, I watch an entire... I watched the entire series of Black Mirror, and there's not a single episode that I watch where I go, oh, that's impossible. Mm -hmm. Like every single one, I'm like, oh, man, I bet, they're, I bet they're already working on that. In fact, the contact lenses that record are already in development at, at Apple mm -hmm. and, or Google, I think, is working on that. So it's like we're really open-minded in the realm of, of science. We, right. we're, we're like sky's the limit. We'll be colonizing Mars in a hundred years. We're all optimistic. We're all open-minded. And yep. obviously he didn't have any of those examples to draw on. We hadn't even landed on the moon yet. Yeah. That, that's his example, right? It's like show anyone, show anyone a newspaper about plans to land on the moon and they'll say, yeah. I bet they do it. You know, today it would be Elon Musk trying to colonize Mars. And we're all like, yeah, I bet he does it. I, I, totally possible. And he's saying here, yet yeah, we've been seeing another kind of flight, a spiritual liberation from this world, people who rose above their problems. And they mm -hmm. said, God made these things possible, and we only smiled. Now, this isn't like a happy smile. This is like, oh, this silly son of a bitch. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And it says, we had seen spiritual release, but like to tell ourselves it wasn't true. Now, I'm going to take you on a journey here, so bear with me. Um, okay. I'd seen spiritual release, but like to tell myself it wasn't true. This is a little bit more than people said God made these things possible and I smiled, right? Like, oh, bless your heart, right? That's, the, mm -hmm. that's Texan for fuck you, right? Bless your heart, right? Yeah. Um, it's more than just that. This is making the claim that I actually like doing that. I actually like to tell myself it's not true. So if I'm driving down the street and I see a homeless person who is insane, you know, screaming about the CIA is coming for them and they're the queen of England and MI5 and all these, right? And I, and I see someone like off the rocker, I have pity on that person for their delusion. I don't, I don't like, I don't like how crazy they are. I'm not finding enjoyment out of that. That's not amusing to me. But when it comes to someone talking about the power of God in their life, oh, there is a bit of satisfaction that comes from the condescending smile that I give them and knowing that they're batshit crazy. These crazy. I remember my early days in AA thinking, I'm going to get sober and I'm going to find out what's really keeping these people sober. And mm -hmm. I'm going to find out what it really is because I know it's not God. And then I'm yeah. going to come back and tell them what it really is so they can stop saying it's God. And it wasn't just that I was having those thoughts. I was enjoying that. It put me on a pedestal of exactly. smarter, right? Mm -hmm. Superiority. Mm -hmm. Then it goes on to say, actually, we were fooling ourselves. Now, in order to fool myself, I have to be hiding the truth from myself. We call this denial, right? I'm lying to myself. So in order to look at someone claiming the power of God in their life, my aunt talking about my sewing circle prayed for me and my flu cleared up, or, you know, someone talking about cancer and, and how, you know, the power of God healed them from cancer, or even the people at meetings who pick up a coin for their anniversary and give all the credit to God. Don't give all the credit to God. You did that. Yeah. Right. In order for me to engage in that type of thinking, I have to be fooling myself. Now, the reason I have to be fooling myself, the reason I'm, I'm engaging in some foolery around this is because deep down in every man, woman, and child is a fundamental idea of God. Now, you might agree or disagree with the statement that they're making here, 
But there is no way to read this without coming to the conclusion that what they are clearly saying is, you already know God. You don't know that you know God. You might not realize you know God, but you do already know God. You are engaging in delusion when you poke fun at people who claim the power of God because you know that that's true. You're suppressing the truth. You're fooling yourself. And I'm making this motion because I might, if you can picture trying to hold a beach ball underwater, mm-hmm. right, to suppress the truth, that cat's adorable. Thank you. <laughs> um, but I, I'm suppressing that truth, pushing it way down. Now, once in a while, life throws something at us, a wave, if you will. And the wave hits me and knocks me off kilter, and I lose a grip on that ball, and it comes rushing to the surface. Mm -hmm. We call that a foxhole prayer. Life circumstances aren't a wave, but the resulting foxhole prayer that comes rushing to the surface, that's that moment when I can't suppress the truth any longer, and I have to call out for help. Yeah. Um, It's the moment that I'm in the back of a squad car saying, please let me go home. Please let me go home. Right. I'm not a believer. I'm not saying, yeah. dear God, I'm not saying amen. I'm not even saying it out loud. I'm just saying it in my head. Please let me go. Please let me go. Please let me go. Who am I talking to? Yeah. Now, later on in the same paragraph, they say, um, faith in a power greater than ourselves and miraculous demonstrations of this power are facts as old as man himself. What that means is since the beginning of time, As long as we've been recording history, two things have been happening for humans, right? We've been demonstrating faith in a power greater than ourselves, those Fox. Mm -hmm. We've been Mm -hmm. talking to something we can't see. We've been appealing to something beyond ourselves. That's been happening since the beginning of time and miraculous demonstrations of that power. Something seems to be responding to it. Those two things have been happening since, since we first started walking around. We've been doing those. We've been engaging in that. Insane. Now, yeah. Now, a mar- miraculous demonstration of that power, for example, is when I get brought back to the police station, and an hour later I'm in the lobby, and a friend of mine's mother is there to pick me up, who I never called. And she's bringing me home within a mm-hmm. couple hours of saying, please let me go home. Right? Now, did I rush to my friends the next day and say, guys, you'll never believe this? When I prayed, God answered, I believe him. Nope. Because that ball came rushing to the surface, and what I do, I scrambled to push it back down as soon as possible. I'm suppressing that truth in order Why to. Why do we do that? Mm-hmm. Great question. The book says this fundamental idea of God may be obscured by three things. Mm hmm. Right, that's in this. It's a sentence I. Yeah, I love. It. This is my favorite, like pretty much favorite part of the book. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, do you know what the word "obscured" means? Um, I mean, I do. It means like hidden, hidden, and more specifically, covered. Covered, yeah. Um, if you can picture a, um, a, taking a car through the mud all day, muddy, and at the end of the day, you've got a thick coat of mud over those headlights. Now you can turn on those headlights and those headlights can be bright and intense, but the mud is keeping you from seeing the light. You can put your hand right up to the headlight and feel the heat and know that the light is real. Mm -hmm. but you don't know it in a way that helps you navigate the road, right? This is back to your earlier question. I know of the truth, that light is Mm -hmm. there, but I don't Mm -hmm. know the truth in a way that's practical. Yeah. So here's me, and this drawing is not to scale, uh, I hope, and (laughs) here's this fundamental idea of God inside of me. Does that show up uh, right ways for you? Yeah. It shows up backwards for me. And there's this light emanating. I don't know if we talked about this before, but when I got sober 
and people criticized me, I would get offended. And what was getting offended was this idea that I'm basically a good person. And I don't know why I had that idea because there's no evidence that I'm a good person. I've got a trail of broken promises and disappointed people and hurt people behind mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. But I'm clinging to this thought of, I'm basically a good guy. Why are you on my case? And I would offer that the reason we can't shake the feeling that we're good people, even though we're really not, yeah. is that this fundamental idea of God is in here, and that idea is good. And we're yeah. mistaking that goodness for our goodness. Now, there's this light, this idea, God, it wants to shine out. But it's coated by mud. It's coated by these things. So I can feel that I'm a good person, but it doesn't manifest in a way that's practical for me. I can right. feel the goodness inside, but not in a way that I can navigate life with it. There's an old Ron White joke, you know, the comedian with the cigars and the brandy. Mm -hmm. right? He does this bit where he talks about a dead tree in his yard. So that dead tree in my yard, the trunk was split in half. You could see all the like rotten pulp on the inside it was real soft and mushy. There was no bark on the tree. There were no leaves. You could see the termite holes. And I called an arborist to come remove the tree from my yard. And he said, this guy goes up to the tree and he scratches it with his fingernail and he looks at it and he comes back and he says, sir, you're mistaken. That tree's not dead. If you look closely, you'll see it has a vibrant core. And Ron goes, let me tell you what I'm looking for in a fucking tree, okay? Because the point is, yeah, the tree might not be dead, dead, but it, for all intents and purposes, it looks dead. So if I'm a good person, but nobody knows, nobody can tell, does it matter? Really? It matters to me, but it doesn't, in the, in the grand scheme of things, I might as well be a terrible person. I've got this light in here, but nobody, including myself, can see it. And nobody can feel it except for me, and those are in rare moments. So the three things that block this light are calamity, pomp, and worship. Mm -hmm. um, you know, since you like homework, I'll go ahead and give you a homework assignment. Do you have a notebook in front of you? I do. Hang on one second. Okay. Okay. So find three blank pages in a row. Okay. At the top of the first one, in the white space at the top, the margin at the top, uh, write the word calamity. Okay. Underneath that, we can define it as tragedy. If you want to write the word tragedy, that's what that means. And when we're looking for tragedy, we want to look at really three things. Bad things happen to me. Bad things happen to people I love. Bad things happen in the world. Right? So I'm looking around the world and I see COVID. Yeah. I see 9-11. I see Hurricane Katrina. I see injustice. Mm -hmm. I see inequality. Um, my sister got raped. I got molested. These are bad things happening in the world. Bad things happening to someone I love. Bad things happening to me. Yeah. And this stuff adds a little coating of dirt to this light that shines. Mm-hmm. Right? Right. All three of these categories finish this statement in a different way, the following statement. This is what I hate about blank. And calamity finishes that statement by saying the world. This is what I hate about the world. So if you want to write that down in quotes, this is what I hate or dislike, if that's if hate's too strong a word, but I think hate's appropriate, this is what I hate about the world. And that adds, you know, that kind of puts that coating of, of mud on there. On the next page, at the very top in the white space at the top in the margin, if you want to write the word palm. Okay. And a definition for that is arrogance. That's where we get the word pompous from. Okay. 
Arrogance is the idea that I am better than other people. Now, if you're going to look for arrogance in your life, you have to be aware that you're not going to find it head on. Nobody, except for an extremely few narcissistic individuals, nobody ever has the conscious thought, I am better than Bill and Doug. We usually don't have that conscious thought of I'm better than others, I'm better than this guy. So we're not going to see we're not going to see pomp head on. We're going to see the signs of pomp. We're going to have to look for the evidence of pomp instead. And this is how pomp manifests. This is how arrogance manifests. <clears throat> I'm going to give you a handful of examples. I'm in line at the grocery store, ten people deep, and there's three clerks over there just jack jawing away. And I'm thinking to myself, why the hell don't they open one other line? At least one other line. It wouldn't take them nothing to do it. It would speed up this whole process. For that matter, why doesn't the goddamn grocery store owner put in some electronic checkouts, some self-checkouts? I mean, that's not too expensive. That's got to yeah. be a simple thing, put in a couple self-checkouts. Mm -hmm. Or I'm on the phone with the bank, pleading with them to refund an overdraft fee. I can't really afford that money being taken out right now. Sorry, sir, I can't do that. I've been a loyal customer for two years. I've never asked you to do this before. Chase gives a, a, a courtesy refund once in a while. You can't do that for me? Um, I'm at the pharmacy trying to fill a prescription, and they say, well, Mr. Stone, it's going to take 15 minutes while I call this in. I say, Joe, you know me. I'm here every month. It's a goddamn antibiotic for crying out loud. You can't just take care of that after I leave? All of those objections to life are undergirded. The foundation of them is the idea that if I were a clerk in a grocery store, I'd know how to do it better. If I owned a grocery store, I'd know how to do it better. If I ran a bank, I'd know to value customer loyalty. If I ran a pharmacy, I'd know how to make things easy for people. And I can't have those thoughts without a subconscious belief that if I can do their job better than them, I am better than them. So these are my objections to life. This finishes the statement, this is what I hate about others. So if you want to write that down, this is what I hate about others. And that adds a nice, another layer of mud and dirt to this. So question. when you said... So this is what I hate about the world is the calamity. Mm -hmm. This is what I hate calamity. about others is the pomp. Mm -hmm. pomp okay. Happiness. Yep. Interesting. And then on the next page, uh, worship of other things in the margin at the top. It goes without saying that it means things other than God. Obviously, worshiping right. God is not worship of other things. Yeah. In a word... The definition of this is idolatry. And if that sounds too religious-y for you, uh, you could also refer to it as ambition. You what was the it. first thing you said? Idolatry. What's that? Uh, it, it means worship of other things, literally. Um, it's the, uh, not to get too religious-sounding, but it's the idea that you shouldn't have any gods before me. Right? So... What do I put in front of? So me? is that the second? Is that the second um, amend or commandment or whatever? Yeah, it's the like, first. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. I was a commandment. <laughs> but if, again, if idolatry sounds too religious-y, um, no, it's fine. It's just I'm, ambition. I'm, yeah, you know? my ambition is good too. It's a good way to look at it. But yeah, I, I'm not like I don't get ruffled usually from yeah. religious though. So. Uh, okay. So it's ambition. Uh, another way of, of looking at this too, in a word, is sacrifice. Sacrifice. Mm -hmm. If you show me something that you are making sacrifices for, the thing you're sacrificing for is the thing you're worshiping. So if you sacrifice time with your family to work overtime at your job, you're worshiping the dollar. If you sacrifice time at your job to go be with your significant other, you're worshiping affection. If you sacrifice mm -hmm. time with your significant other to go get high, you're worshiping escape, recreation. Right? Yeah. Um, 
And again, obviously making sacrifices for God is worshiping God. So that's not what we're talking about. But if I'm sacrificing for anything else, um, especially if I'm sacrificing seeking good, if I have an opportunity to seek good, but I go in this direction instead, that's what I'm worshiping. I, yeah, I totally get it. It's important to realize that these things are not just material, although a lot of them are, but it can also include things like recognition, approval, uh, affection, security. I can be worshiping these things. Mm -hmm. Uh, A lot of people in the program are mistakenly worshiping at the altar of personal development and calling it recovery. Which is what we touched on for Mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. And this is the final nail in the coffin. It's the final thing that blocks out that light. So um, now I want to explore this idea really quickly, uh, a little deeper about sacrifice and worship. And you have to follow me a little bit here. Um, If I'm making sacrifices for things, well, first of all, have you made sacrifices for things in your life before? Things other than God. Oh, yeah. Is it fair to say that at least some of those sacrifices are things you've later regretted doing? Yeah. So if my worship of other things can can be distilled down to my regrets, then this represents everything, or this this is what I hate about myself. That's how this completes the sentence. Okay, hang on, let me... Yeah, I'm just thinking, like, because for me, a big one is, like, it's been, I told you, like, the relationship stuff is, like, really a hard one for me. Mm -hmm. And I came into the program with a seven-year relationship that I seriously, like, it was, like, a a God moment to even walk away from it. Yeah. And I tried to even take it back two months later, and, like, God, like, handled the situation, luckily. And, like, but... um then I've continued to like sacrifice, like as soon as I get into a relationship, I throw away like everything else relationships with other people, like all the stuff that I do that makes me feel good, all the affirmation stuff and the stuff that I do to like fill me up. And I do it every time pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that that's worship and, and the regrets that you have in those areas, right? Mm -hmm. That's like, this is what I hate about myself. And again, if hate's too strong a word, then it's, um, you know, a don't like or dislike, right? But I, I think hate's appropriate. You know, uh, calamity is everything I hate about the world. Pomp yeah. is everything I hate about others. And worship is everything I hate about myself. Love it. Now, when we say that we are fooling ourselves, we're suppressing the truth, it might imply that I'm doing that consciously but this is the answer to your previous question of why do we yeah. do this? And I would offer well, that it's this stuff that actually does it. And it, even if we, ch- so like, cause my first thought is like, cause you know how they, they talk about like, we smile or whatever. Mm-hmm. And like, and that's an arrogant, that's coming from oh, yeah. arrogance. Absolutely. And that's still contribute. That's still attributed to pomp. So it go it like ties right into it anyways. So like, so yeah, if, I, if I'm looking at trusting God with my life, and I've got a laundry list of bad shit happening in the world and in my life and in other, is that going right. to, is that going to block me from the power of God? Absolutely. Right. If, if God is real and I'm not actually better than anybody else because we're all God's kids, that yeah. means, is that going to block me from trusting God? Yeah. Cause I need God not to be real so I can be better than others. And if I'm going to have to sacrifice some of these things that I'm worshiping to trust God, is that going to block me from God? Absolutely. So these three. I, I, I get that. That's a hard, that's a hard one. <laughs> that's a hard one. Especially, I mean, it makes me think of, well, a couple things. First of all, like I'm, it, I'm immediately made me think of this one guy in my early sobriety who used to talk about his daughter dying at a young age. And like those kinds of moments, like people will chalk up to like, there is no God because like, how could this ever happen? You know? Well, and uh, even, even someone who could say there is a God, but I'm mad as hell, they're going to be blocked because of that tragedy, right? It's not just about whether or not I believe. It's about can I trust and rely. And, um, uh, you know, that's 
Right. So I just wanted to add that because not just, I don't believe because of the tragedy. No, that's actually really helpful. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> um, the other thing I was thinking is like, yeah, I don't, the things that I struggle with that I worship, that I, the worship of other things, this, this is my big one for me. This has always been the hardest one for me. Cause it'll literally switch like this week. I went and spent a bunch of, I've been shopping a lot lately yeah. and, um, I went and bought a guitar, which I'm stoked about, but I spent a lot of money this week, like a lot. And, and instead of like doing the, like the other thing that I usually do, like dating and stuff what is a good like example that I've been like shopping and it dawned on me after I bought my guitar, I was like, cause I was really feeling super connected and good. And, uh, I was like, oh, my higher power just switched to shopping. <laughs> I was like, that's the illusion of power is coming from shopping now. So I feel good because I'm shopping. Someone once said at a meeting that hit me like a ton of bricks. The reason I, all money represents to me is an opportunity to exert my will. That's all money boils down to is like, I can stop at a store and make someone make me a cup of coffee. I can uh, make someone make me a burger. I can make someone deliver furniture. Like money is the ability for me to exert my will. And um, that's, that's why it feels so important. We'll hide that under the guise of ambition and security and responsibility. But really it's me um, hey. exerting my will. No, Kiki. Get down. Sorry. She's... No problem. Go. Psst. Go on. Okay, I'm with you. So, do you so, have um, do you have the bandwidth for about ten more minutes of exploration on this? Can we? Yeah. Okay. So we have this model of me me being blocked from God, this big black hole. And and by the way, I think it's I think it's a subtle distinction, but it's important to make. I don't have a God sized hole in front of me, right? Like inside of me, like you hear people say. I used to say it at meetings too. I've got a God sized hole. No, mm -hmm. it's that I've got a place where God is buried, right? Like God's in me and, yeah. and he's just buried, right? Um, yeah. The funny thing for believers when I'm, when I'm working with believers and I do this illustration for them, what I like to point out to them is this is what Jesus meant when he said, don't hide your light under a basket. Sermons today, you don't have to know the story, but that's what he said. He told his followers don't light a candle and hide it under a basket. And everyone took that to mean, oh, don't be afraid to tell people you're Christians, except that Christianity didn't exist yet, right? <laughs> so he's not talking about that. He's talking about the light of God that's in us. We hide it underneath our anger and our greed and our arrogance and our regrets and our shame. Like he's saying, don't hide that under there. Um, and when I say that to people that are that are Christians at step two, it hits them like you're blocked because they realize, oh, I've been doing that. Like, yeah, that's what I was. That's where my head just went to because I was like, well, then are we just supposed to not do all those things? But then, like, I was thinking, like, then that's an act of will. Like, we're trying to will our way out of doing those things, and that's not necessarily what the point is of this, right? Yeah. So. Um, the next paragraph kind of talks to us about that. It says, we finally saw that faith in some kind of God was part of our makeup, just as much as a feeling we have for a friend. Mm -hmm. right? You can't prove that you love a friend of yours. Mm -hmm. right? You just know it's just part of who you are. You mm -hmm. know, right? Then it goes on to say, sometimes we had to search fearlessly. I would ask you to underline those two words if you don't have them underlined already. Search fearlessly. What does that remind you of? Uh, like the fourth step, probably, if that's what you're prodding for. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Sometimes we yeah. had to search fearlessly, but he was there. Um, he was as much a fact as we were. We found the great reality, capital letters, deep down within us. That's a promise. You yeah. Will, you will find God underneath yeah. this pile of shit. Yeah. In the final analysis, it is only there that he may be found. That's a warning. You won't find him anywhere else. 
Now, the reason they need to warn us about that is because if I sit still long enough and my gaze starts to turn inward, I'm going to see this pile of horse shit from a mile away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? This is why... This is why it's like we put the cart before the horse when a newcomer comes in and we say, meditate, just give it a try. And they go and they sit still for three minutes and yeah. they look inside. Well, if I'm like this and I look inside for God, is God going to be the first thing I see? No. The first thing I'm going to see is everything I hate about myself, everything I hate yeah. about others, everything I hate about the world. It's yeah. all going to come, you know, worldly clamors. It's all going to come rushing to the surface. And that's what I hear people say. I have trouble meditating. Well, yeah. Yeah. You're not, you're not clear yet. Right. Um, so we have to search through this stuff because as soon as my gaze starts turning inward, right, I don't like it. And I will do anything to avoid it. If you and I were walking in a field, having casual conversation, looking at one another, talking, and there's like a lull in the conversation where we both look forward for a second and you notice that you are just about to step into a big pile of horse shit. You would do physical gymnastics to avoid stepping in it, right? You'd balance on your heel. You might somersault forward or back foot backwards or cartwheel or, you know, whatever. You contort in a way, like, especially if you just, like, as soon as you notice it, right? Mm -hmm. Well, in the same way, we will do mental gymnastics to avoid looking in here. And so I'll look over here in a relationship or I'll look over here in food or the internet or a job or recognition, or approval, or shopping, right? I'll look everywhere, in every direction, except for where the peace is at, because peace isn't initially there. I have to dig through all this shit first. I have to search fearlessly through yeah. all this shit to get to the light that's underneath. Now, if we were in that field and you had scraped your knee avoiding the horse shit, and I started chuckling a little bit, You'd be like, Derek, party foul, man. I just scraped my knee like you're laughing at me. I would say, no, Janelle, I'm not laughing at your pain. I'm laughing because you don't realize that buried underneath that horse shit is a solid bar of 24 karat gold pure. Um, if that's true and you believe me, you would be digging horse shit out of your fingernails for three days. Like you wouldn't even go grab gloves. You'd just be like, boom, there, I got it. Yeah. yeah. And that is what the next paragraph means when it says we can only clear the ground a bit. You and I having conversations can only clear this stuff up a little bit. Yeah. But if our testimony, my testimony, the, the story that I've told you enables you to do three things. Think honestly, search diligently within yourself. There's that four step language again. Um, and hold on. Now I'm, now I've got to read it for myself. If it can help you um, sweep away prejudice, enables you to think honestly, and encourages you to search diligently within yourself, then if you wish, you can join us on the broad highway. There's only one other place where they mention the broad highway, and it's right after the fifth step, where they say we now feel we are on a broad highway. So they are bracketing that four-step process, mm -hmm. this broad highway language, yeah. And in step two, they're using all this language about searching fearlessly and searching diligently. Mm -hmm. In very clear language, they're making the statement that it is not possible to have a relationship with God without inventory. I have to be willing to wade through this shit to get mm -hmm. to the gold. Yeah. I have to be willing to dig through the shit to get to the gold. Now, if people dig through the shit and don't see it for what it is, Right? Yeah, I dug through it. My hands are dirty, but I never found the gold underneath. That's spiritual make believe. And there are a lot of, uh, I don't know who, maybe it's Bob D, calls them scribblers who are just constantly writing inventory. Mm -hmm. They're mastering the mechanics, but they don't understand the purpose. The purpose of, there's no magic about writing names on paper, it's about getting to the gold underneath and getting to the mm -hmm. roots and that mm -hmm. light gone. Right? Um, but that's the purpose at hand. You know, is we want to dig through that shit to find the peace underneath of it. Yeah. And yeah. atheist believers and agnostics all look like this when they walk in. They all do. In fact, one of the directions this goes in is church, ministry, 
right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And people that are living in the world of spiritual make believe can veer off in a direction of being a service junkie. Have you ever seen those service junkies that'll just volunteer for everything and they're me? Yeah, I w- my my sponsor, my current sponsor. I met her and she's like, "How many service positions do you have?" I had like eight, and they were like big ones. All of them were like like women's conferences and like yeah. GSR and like all of the above. And she's like, "You're not allowed to have any more." <laughs> No more service commitments for you for well, a while. Because what is the, what am I avoiding something by doing that? You know, it's like, yeah. I think you're doing the right thing for the wrong reason. Yeah. And, and that's what this is talking about. Is like, if, if, if all those, if the busy work that I'm doing is to avoid this, well, then it's not helping me. Yeah. If, if the work that I'm doing is because this is cleared off, we've washed this off and we've gotten the light inside of us now to the surface you know so that not only do i feel the heat but i can see the light you know Mm -hmm. that's that's the point of of the work that we're doing like two things are coming up for me one of them is is i'm like pretty emotional because i'm feeling like kind of just sad that i'm I don't, my experience has been like, it's just switch, like when they talk about like the whack-a-mole disease or whatever, like it's just switched from one to the next to the next. And like, I feel like I've had experiences with my higher power. I've seen my higher power work in my life since even before I got sober, yeah. but especially since, since I've been sober, but it makes me wonder like if I've really like had the experience that's like connected me truly like with my higher power and then the other thought is is like when that's all is it ever all cleared do we or is that like that that's the lifelong thing well you know that's a great question um what i will say is when i work with people consistently in the like two to five year mark who have kind of hit a wall in their recovery. And we sit down and talk um, and they're doing the deal. These aren't people who've hit a wall that aren't doing anything. These are people who are doing the deal and they've hit a wall, Um, right? Because it's easy to identify if you've hit a wall but you're not doing the work, well, yeah. I mean, maybe that's what it is, right? Right. Um, Usually what we find is that they haven't improved their conscious contact with God. They, they did. And this is why it's a red flag when someone comes in and says, I, I found my higher power. What they're really saying is I picked my higher power. I've picked my horse. I'm going to, I'm going to stay the whole race with this horse. I'm betting on this. And, mm-hmm. and that's why I say step two is not about picking the higher power. It's not build a bear. It's not like yeah. I'm trying to construct and Frankenstein from all the stuff that I think I know. It's about, am I open for going on a journey of truth seeking that's going to lead me where it leads me, wherever it leads me? Mm -hmm. I'm willing to constantly be evolving that thought. The only thing that the book calls growth is when we start to accept spiritual ideas that were at one point out of reach for us. Right. That's the only thing it calls growth. Yeah. Um, And the only thing it tells us we have to improve is our conscious content. Well, that's digging through more and more layers of this. Mm-hmm. And some people will dig through enough of it to get a little bit of freedom, and then they'll start burying themselves and other stuff to avoid digging deeper. And so, um, you know, they pick their higher power at step two at thirty days sober, and it's yeah. the same one they're using four years later. Right. And it's like I don't know that that's wrong or right, but if you're hitting a wall with it, it's probably not working for you. Yeah. I mean, the higher power I needed at 30 days sober was just a force of energy that I could tap into. That higher power would not handle my problems today. Right. And that was my, I don't think that this, me working with you would have, um, I don't think I would have been as open to it if I hadn't have had that experience this year where I, it was like an, e- it was huge ego inflation. I had to get a bigger higher power this year mm. at the beginning of the year because of something that came up for me. So, and I was like, I don't trust. And I still have areas where I'm like, I can openly say like, I don't trust that God's got this. Yeah. And that's the biggest, um, that's the biggest block. I mean, honestly, it's like, 
great, your behavior is impeccable, but you're trusting your behavior being impeccable over trusting God. You know? Yeah. That's And that's that's the people worshiping at the altar of personal development. They're worshiping the mechanics of the program. Mm-hmm. They're putting their faith in their ability to do this stuff good um, instead of um, trusting that, you know, that there's, there's a higher power. And I think part of that's the program's fault. We're just not encouraging people to challenge their beliefs. We're telling people that whatever you believe is fine. Yeah, whatever you believe is fine at step two. The rest of the steps are designed to help you grow past that. And I mean, we literally have a step that says improve our conscious contact with God. Mm-hmm. And nobody's talking about how, like I never hear someone tell a newcomer maybe it's, well, I shouldn't say that, but, but look, maybe it's time you improve your conscious contact with God. I can't tell you how many people I've set free with just that simple suggestion. Like maybe it's time to grow deeper and start looking, you know, start looking at what could this be. I've had sponsees that tell me, you know, the nightly review, I struggle with the part where it says we ask God's forgiveness because I don't think God forgives. Mm-hmm. Or I can't picture God forgiving me. And it's like, well, you definitely need a, a new God at that point. Mm-hmm. The higher power that got you to this point won't take you past this point. Yeah. And it's not about, again, it's not about inventing a new higher power. It's about yeah. what am I learning about truth? What more can I learn? Yeah. So yeah. um, I had a friend who once said this, and I don't know, I don't know how I feel about it. It sounds really good. He said, the first thing you have is a spiritual awakening. And after that, everything you have is a spiritual experience. Now, I know that from a big book perspective, that's not accurate. The book lets us know that those two terms are interchangeable. They mean the same thing. But from a practical perspective, there is this phenomenon of having an initial awakening to spirituality and Mm -hmm. then having moments where it's reinforced and we see it and we have deeper growth. Mm -hmm. And it's quite possible um, that that's what's happening for you. I mean, I, I think so. I think, yeah. It's, it seems to be- it's not a problem if it isn't. Like, I wouldn't beat yourself. Like, if you go through this whole process and you discover, wow, I've really just been riding self-will for four years and I haven't actually been, like, sober. It's like, who cares? You discovered it before relapse. You know what I mean? It's not a bad thing if you're discovering something like that. Like, I wouldn't beat yourself up. I'm I'm not saying I think that's what's been happening. You seem pretty well yeah. to me. Um, uh, but I'm just saying, even even worst case, if that's what you if that's what you come away with, yeah, and you got you caught it before relapse. Like that's the important thing. I mean, that's right. Like that's the hum- that's the humility piece, right? Yeah. Like yeah, yeah. I don't. I mean, I honestly think that you've had something. If you're asking my opinion now. I don't think my opinion's worth all that much, right? Like I have an opinion about that opinion, but yeah. if you're asking my opinion, like I don't, I, I don't suspect that you're faking or anything. I would just say maybe God's calling you to a deeper relationship right now. Ooh, it's, it's a lot. It's good. It's like good, but it's like also. Yeah, it's just emotional. It just feels like it feels hard to get out of, I don't know, even like old, I don't know. I just feel like I don't even know where, like where I'm at right now. Like I'm just like breaking out of something that, like you said, like has gotten me kind of this far or whatever, you know, and and my spiritual relationship with my higher power has like definitely deepened, but it feels like a whole new kind of realm that I'm stepping into and it's really scary. And like a lot of me wants to like fight against it or question it or whatever, which is why I've had like so many questions, you know? So, but, but it's good stuff. We'll get you there. (laughs) I mean, one way or another. Or I'll tell you when, um, I regularly have people, um, come up to me and tell me stuff like, 
you know, you're blowing my mind. I feel dumb. I feel like I've never read this book before. Like people that are sober that go to big book studies and teach other people and help other people. And I say that because when I sat down with my sponsor, the one that I have now, like I learned from everybody. Yeah. I mean, right. I do. I learned from everybody. Everybody. Yeah. Something. Yeah. Um, I take notes, but I have never, not for a long time, learned this much from one singular source yeah this guy it'd just be an hour of mind blown after mind blown after i mean it wouldn't be one aha moment it's like yeah trying to drink from a fire hose and i would every time i'd meet with him i'd walk out of his house saying to myself that's what that feels like <laughs> that must be what that feels like like not knowing like having not known like literally walking out going, have I ever even read this thing before? Yeah, I know. That's what I feel like too. Like my whole program feels like it's been shaken in a snow globe kind of. Yeah, that's a good analogy. And I just yeah. want you to know I can relate to that. And, and you know, it's like, uh, I don't think that that means I was working a shitty program. I just think it means God was calling me to something deeper and he did it through this individual. You know, um, I could be wrong about that. But if I'm wrong yeah. about that, I'm wrong about both of us. Like, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just saying I'm in the same boat with you when I learn new stuff, you know. Um, and it, it's, you know, you get going, you get in a groove where it's like you think you have it. And then, like, mm -hmm. there's ways that I've presented step one in my early recovery that I'm appalled by today. Like, when I hear other people teaching it, it's like, oh, my God, don't tell people that stuff. And then it's like, but mm -hmm. I'm Mm -hmm. I know I did it, right? I know that that was truth for me, and I was really interested mm -hmm. in it. And, mm -hmm. You know, I'm open. I'm open to to having that experience. So. It would be nice if I mean I know it's impossible because we're all individuals with our own experience. But it would have been so nice if the program was just universal, <laughs> and it was basically the same across the board, so that there wasn't so many like misconceptions. Well, there it was for a time. Have you ever read Back to Basics? No, but I should. I've had it once, and I didn't end up reading it. It's it's really it's like ten bucks on Amazon. Um, okay. And not a not a dime of it goes to the author. He donates all of it, I think, to AA or some other charity. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's AA though. Um, but yeah, he doesn't keep any of it, and it's like the best ten bucks you can spend in recovery. Really? Yeah, I. It's a good. I highly recommend it. Okay, I'm it's, gonna get it. Some people aren't a fan of it. Uh, yeah, because, one. I wonder if I will be even. Because <laughs> I get so I get nervous about back to I. When people are like, when they're so like rigid, like that's what I've noticed about like old school AA is it's so rigid that I have a hard time with it. Well, you can't have your cake and eat it too, right? If you want AA to be universal, then it's got to be. I know. <laughs> There's only one way to preserve universal. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> that's true. That's a good point. Okay. Well, and so with this homework, is this actual homework or did you just want me to write like. It yeah, it's a good exploration. Going? Yeah, no. Um, you can, uh, if you want okay. to spend some time, you know, you devoted a page to each one. It doesn't mean you have to fill a page, but you have the space. And mm -hmm. maybe 10 minutes a day, you just sit down and think of what's the tragedy in my life? What's the pomp in my life? When you're looking at pomp, like who specifically do you feel smarter than? Either individuals yeah. or groups of people, um, types of people. Oh my gosh. Can I just put everyone, <laughs> like pretty much everyone? Even if I don't say it, even if I don't act like it, like I think I, I live my life like that. Well, I think it might be useful to have an experience with writing itemizing as much as you can. Okay, I will. We definitely like hiding the, the trees behind the forest, you know? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I get what you're saying. Like, I mean, I, yeah, I'm immediately, I'm already thinking of where the line is drawn between like who I'm superior to and who I am under. <laughs> well, and as you start thinking about these things, right, your brain will start massaging the truth a little bit 
and talk you out of it, right? Like your heart says, oh yeah, when I think about that person, I definitely think I'm better than them. And your brain goes, yeah. well, let's talk about this for a minute. And then you'll examine yeah. it and yeah. you're like, cool, I'm at a place where intellectually I realize I'm not better than them. And your heart's going, but we still kind of feel better than them, mm -hmm. right? And right, like the, the McDonald's worker, it's like, oh, but they, you know, they do a hard job. They deal with hard customers all day, uh, blah, 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 blah. But yeah, no, like internally, I'm like. Yeah, yeah so you want to listen to this yeah. as much as possible. Listen to this, okay. not, not this. Um, <laughs> and it's a hard exercise, right? It, it's That's hard. a scary it's one. It's not, uh, it's not a right or wrong answer. It's not about me grading. Did you understand properly? It's about you having experience. In fact, you could do this and never share it with me and still get something out of the experience. Like, it's not something that I need to know the answers to. This is just something that, that you can have an experience with. Okay. And is this, sorry, this is like, I know, I'm so sorry. I know I asked like so many questions, but is this, would this be helping me on earth what my prejudices are or no? Is sure. that something that you do? Yeah. I don't know. Now that you say that, I don't really spend any time on um, prejudices, right? It's like I just assume everybody has them. Mm -hmm. um, that's something to think about, though, because I, I do know. So this lady named Tina Albert, I don't know if you've ever heard of her. She was sponsored by Clancy. She came and did a t like 1 through 12 at a retreat I went to. And... Uh, she asked me point blank, like, what's my experience with step two? And I think she was looking for like an answer about prejudices. Mm. And I hadn't, I didn't have one to share because when I got, so all three of my sponsors so far with my step two, they've literally, because of my experience of the bottom that I had in my step one experience, they literally just moved me right through. They always move me right through to like three, basically. Like we read the book together, but they don't, we don't touch on two like ever for some reason. Because I, because I, because of the experience I had, I don't know. Well, I guess the prejudice, I don't call it prejudice, but the closed mindedness, right? Like the, the prejudice that the atheist has is that there is no God. The prejudice that the believer has is that AA can't do yeah. anything about God. Um, right. And that's kind of as far as I go with it. Um, well, because like with, with the believer even, because I was a believer. But, like, I know I had prejudices, too, obviously, because we all do. And I think, like, some of them would be, like, I made a lot of reasons and rhymes as to why things happened in my life based on what I thought God was trying to, like, work out in my life. Like, I was, like, you know, there, like, one of them would have been, like, everything happens for a reason. Not that I'm yeah. saying I don't believe that, but, like, that would be an example of one for me, I think. I know for me, like, as a practicing Satanist, I'm looking at prayer and meditation. I'm going, I can't do that. Yeah. And I'm not going to get on my knees, bow my head, fold my hands, say, dear father. And, and yeah. The and the yeah. sponsor said, who told you that's what prayer has to look like? Yeah. And I said, well, that's what prayer is. He says, no, you're bringing that to the table. That's your practice. Yeah. You know, yeah. So I can have prejudice about stuff that, like isn't even necessarily bad. Like there's nothing wrong with getting on your knees and bowing your head. That's just, I didn't, I just assumed prayer couldn't be anything else, you know? And, and we don't, when people go to great lengths to say, it doesn't have to be God. It could be a higher power. They're demonstrating their prejudice toward the word God. I know. It's so true. I, I would rather hear people say, it doesn't have to be the Christian God. It could be any God. It's like in step two, it's like, yes, we are talking about God, but we are talking about willingness. We're not talking about, um, you're going to believe yeah. the line and sinker today in, and we're also talking about, um, God as you grow to understand, you know, we're talking about going on a journey for truth. We're not talking about, um, inventing a higher power. We're talking about, yeah, like we don't like, we don't need to do any of that really. It's just. <laughs> I, and I love how you phrased it in like, yes, no, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. It reminds me of like when you pass a note and you're like, do you like me? Yes, no, maybe. <laughs> and it's like, that's, I mean, that's all you need to know, right? Like, yeah, maybe slash I don't know because agnostics could be I don't, right? 
But it's like, there's no fourth option. Those are the three answers to that question. Logically speaking, there's no kind of, right? It's like pregnant. You can't kind of be pregnant. You either are, you aren't, or you're not sure. Mm -hmm. There there can't be one. I kind of am. It's like, no, is there a God? Yes, no, maybe. There's no, if you're a kind of, you're in the, you're in the, I don't know category. Well, and like you said, it's not even there a God. It's like, are you willing? What was on page 57? Is that what it was? 47. 47. Like, do you now believe or are you willing to believe? Well, that's the question for step two. The first part of that question, do you now believe? Yeah. The answer to that tells you what category you're in, right? Okay. Yes, no, maybe. The answer to the second part, are you willing to believe, is really, if what you believe is wrong, would you want to know? Yeah, okay. That's like the proposition. Mm -hmm. Okay. And actually, I sometimes just ask it that way. Yeah. Because that'll give me a read on what people, you know, if what you believe would you want is wrong, would you want to know? And I've had people look at me and say, it's not wrong. I'm saying that. Uh huh. And it's fun with Christians because it's like, I agree, it's not wrong. But if it was, would you want to know? You know, because it's, there's something, and this is, this is what it is with like, can I know of the truth, but not know the truth? Yeah. You're using the word God and you're using words like faith and prayer but you're not, there's something blocking you. And so there's gotta be, you know, some deeper truth. And so there's something about what you're doing that's wrong. I'm just asking, would you want to know? Would you want to go on a journey that reveals? I don't even pretend to know what the truth is. You know, like if I say, if what you believe is wrong, would you want to know? I've had people say, well, what, what's wrong about it? I don't, I don't pretend to know what's wrong about it. I'm just saying, would you want me to guide you on a journey that might lead you to the truth? I'm not yeah. going to tell you the truth. I'm going to lead you on a process that will get you. I mean, we wouldn't be doing this stuff if there wasn't something driving us to do it, right? So, like, get that far. You might as well keep going if you really want to know the truth about yourself. And I get why people, like, close the door at that question because it's really scary to think that it's just shaky grounds. It's like, just like I was saying, like, it just feels like shaky grounds kind of as far as like, I thought I knew what I was doing. I thought I had a handle on life and on my spiritual, you know, understanding and experience, but like, it's possible. I have no idea what the hell I'm doing. So, you know, or never had that experience in the first place or whatever. So. I mean, it's possible that that's true of me. I mean, yeah. I, you know, I, that, that's where like some of this just has to be the humility of like, okay, God's in charge. Like I trust, I trust God even with that. Mm-hmm. Pe- the people that are clinging to, how do I know I've had this thing and how do I know I can maintain this thing? Uh, I don't know, like trust God. Like, how, why do you need to know? Why can't it just be good yeah. that God's in charge? Um, so there's even a lack of surrender around that, I think, sometimes, you know? I mean, I think I'm kind of just hearing in general, for me, like, maybe a lot of ego, a lot more ego than I thought was there, maybe, perhaps. Sure. Like, why do I need to hold on? Yeah, like you said, like, why do I even need to know? that like if i really trust god then none of that really matters like i'm just doing the exploration like i don't need to have a like like something like a um, bragging rights that like i knew what i was doing kind of thing yeah here's what i say i heard this at a meeting and i stole it um i talk the talk and i stumble the walk like i'm not (laughs) not by any means walking the walk perfectly, but I'm aware that I'm stumbling forward and that I'm not committed to perfection. Like I, it's not important to me anymore. I don't need to be perfect. Um, I just need to be useful and remain open to a new experience. Okay. Yeah. 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 And I, you know, I did not think I was going to have a new experience with Dave. Yeah especially like the way that guy presents step one is not my cup of tea at all. And after that first session, I'm like, uh, uh, I might've made a mistake. Yeah. And two through 12, he just blew my mind. I was like, Oh wow, this is 
So it's like, we don't have to believe everything everyone says, but mm -hmm. there can be, there can be shifts that we have. Like my understanding of step three and step 11 today are vastly different things to him. Um, and yeah, there is a sense of, was I even really sober before that? You know, it's like, well, I don't know. It was like 18, 18 years sober when I started working with Dave. So I can't say that I wasn't. <laughs> yeah. but, but there is that sense of what, and it's like ultimately God knows the answer to that. The, the point is if I wasn't, I caught it before it ended tragically. Mm -hmm. um, that's the real important takeaway for me. Yeah. You know, if I wasn't the living and spiritual make-believe for 17 years, I caught it before yeah. it ended. And really Did you, and you had an experience, I'm guessing with him working the steps that changed your, your experience. Yeah. Yeah, he, um, yeah, I mean, literally walking away every time thinking, uh, have I even read this book before? Yeah. I just have you, do you struggle with outside stuff or have you? And I'm sure you have because everyone does, but like outside stuff. What do you mean? What do you mean? Like, um, just like food, whatever to like the worship of other things stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that stuff that stuff is a um that stuff is a struggle. For sure. Um and we can't be rid of those things without God's help. It's 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 a weird I haven't used this analogy in a long time, but I think it's still pretty good. It's like there's a wall between me and God. Like I can't tear down that wall. I need God's help to tear down that wall, right? I need to ask God for that help because he's not just going to do it. Mm -hmm. so, like, yeah, I have to be aware, first of all, that there's a wall, right? Well, I have to be aware that I need God for something. Then I have to be aware that it's not as simple as, like, I'm not connected, there's a wall. And then I have yeah. to be aware that I can't tear down the wall. And then I've got to ask God for help with that wall. I'm, I'm literally asking God yeah. for help to grow closer. Well, and that's... I was, that's what I was trying to tell. So with the Love Addicts Anonymous stuff or whatever, like when we went over the vicious cycle, I shared about that on Tuesday because seriously, like with the love stuff or whatever, I understand, that, like I see it clearly. Like I am in the vicious cycle. Like I, and uh, my friend, that's what I was saying. Like my friend was like, you work such a better program. Like, why are you doing that? And I'm like, I wouldn't do it if I had power over not doing it. I have no power to not do it. That's the point. Like I'm, I have no power. Lack of power was our dilemma. Like that's where I'm at with it. And when I, when I do six and seven, people will often accuse me of giving an alcoholic an out because for me, those steps are about self-acceptance. They're not about pursuing perfection. They're not about going on a seek and destroy mission for my character. Yeah. Friends. Yeah. And, and people will say, well, you're giving an alcoholic an out. My point is if you are at seven and you still need an out, you're not at seven. You miss something because through the process of five, I'm not looking for an excuse to keep engaging in behavior. Mm -hmm. right? Like I'm not, I'm not looking for justification. Yeah. Um, you know. I really do want to face and be rid of when I, when I approach four and five, like I want to face and be rid of mm -hmm. not like according to my own will, but like to see the truth about, like see it in a different light and not be right about it anymore yeah. so that I can let it go. So I get what you're saying. Cause I kind of do the same thing too. Like I'm like kind of big on like giving yourself a break, you know, like we're not perfect and we're humans and we mess up all the time. and. That's why we have like, you know, step 10. Yeah. So. I mean, the watch word is useful. That's what we're, I mean, that's what we're going for is usefulness. And so yes. many people sacrifice usefulness in the pursuit of perfection. And it's like, all right, dude, I don't know what version of the program that is, but it's not, it's not the one that has God at the center. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause God's all the perfection I need. Yep. Yeah, I agree.